A new novel by Canadian author Guy Gabriel Kay is always an occasion for celebration. Does his new book, All the Seas of the World, live up to the high standards set by his previous works? Welcome to the Library Ladder. Earlier this year, I made two videos about Guy Gavriel Kay in which I stated my opinion that Kay is the greatest living fantasy author working today. I also ranked his novels, from those that are merely very good, to those that are true masterpieces. This video is an addendum to those earlier ones, as I briefly review and rank his latest book. All the Seas in the World is the third book in a loosely connected trilogy set in a fictional world shared with several other Kay novels. Generally, Kay's books can be read as standalones, and in the case of the first two books in this trilogy, I think it's true. In fact, I think it works equally well to read those two books in chronological order, with A Brightness Long Ago first, as it does to read them in publication order, starting with Children of Earth and Sky. With his latest book, I really can't say that. Reading order matters for this one. All three books take place in a historical setting inspired by the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance period in the Mediterranean region of our world, when rival Italian city-states battled amongst themselves for economic, military, and cultural supremacy, while also failing to prevent and respond effectively to the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople. Chronologically, All the Seas of the World takes place about four or five years after the events of a brightness long ago, and about 20 years before Children of Earth and Sky. Not only are All the Seas of the World and a brightness long ago closely linked in time, they also share some key characters whose arcs in the earlier book are important to understanding their actions and motivations in this latest book. On top of that, this new novel includes explicit, spoilery references to major plot points from the preceding book. As a result, I strongly recommend reading A Brightness Long Ago before All the Seas of the World. Before jumping into a description of the book's plot, let me just say that, as always, I'll be keeping it relatively brief and non-specific in order to avoid spoilers. Whereas the two previous books in this trilogy take place in settings roughly comparable to early 16th century Italy, the Balkans, Greece, and Western Turkey, this latest novel broadens the geographic scope to include several cities on the equivalent of the northern coast of Africa. Again, let me reiterate that this is a completely fictional world Kay created that happens to be partly inspired by real people, places, and historical events from our world. In our world, those coastal cities correspond to Tunis, Algiers, and Oran, in what we today know as Tunisia and Algeria. In the Middle Ages, though, those port cities were home to Barbary pirates, who raided European villages and merchant vessels, enslaved countless thousands of innocent captives, and were ruled by powerful warlords or sultans who paid homage to the Ottoman Empire in former Constantinople, while maintaining a degree of independence from the empire as well. At the center of the plot of all the seas of the world is a pair of seafaring merchants who own their own ship and operate out of one of the coastal ports controlled by the pirates. They're not simply merchants, though, as they're also part-time corsairs who engage in a little mercenary piracy of their own when the opportunity presents itself. When the book begins, they're in the midst of planning and executing their biggest undertaking yet, They've been hired by the warlord rulers of one of the other coastal cities to arrange the assassination of a rival warlord who rules the third city on the coast. The outcome of that assassination attempt sets in motion a chain of events that cause ripples throughout the entire quasi-Mediterranean region and bring the reader in contact with people, places, and conflicts, both religious and secular, that played pivotal roles in Kay's previous two books. In this fictional world, there are three major religious faiths. Jadite, which is roughly analogous to Christianity in our world. Asherite, which has many similarities to Islam. And Kindath, which has a history and culture closely paralleling that of Judaism. The fall of Serantium, the eastern heart and crown jewel of the Jadite faith to Asherite invaders a few years before the start of this book, has unsettled the Jadite world. Some Jadites are eager to launch a holy war against the Asherites to reclaim their lost lands and their lost glory. 
other Jedites, including prominent merchant princes, are more accepting of the situation and prefer to establish and strengthen economic ties with the Asherites through expanded trade, rather than face the economic disruption and privations of war. And still others see an opportunity to persecute minorities, such as the Kendath, who live among the Janites and are easy targets for misplaced retribution. The two merchant pirates at the heart of the story are an unlikely pair. The first, Raphael, is a Kendath refugee from Esperania, which several years earlier had expelled or forced the religious conversion of all the Kendath in its territory, much like Spain did to its Jewish population in the 15th century with the Alhambra Decree. His pirate partner is a woman, Lenya, a Janite who was enslaved as an adolescent girl by Asherite raiders, was then trained to serve as a bodyguard to one of their leaders, and eventually escaped and was rescued by Raphael. Their situations are emblematic of an overarching theme of the book, the plight of the displaced, the uprooted, and the unhomed, and their search for safety, stability, and places or peoples to call their own. The book's title, All the Seas of the World, is a direct reference to people who live their lives adrift, both literally and metaphorically, without a true home. Other linked themes in the book echo those found in many of Kay's other works. There is the juxtaposition of broad and implacable cultural, economic, and geopolitical forces against the profound impact a single individual or even a single decision can have on the course of history. Kay is also preoccupied in the book with the idea of legacy, what we each leave behind when we die and our stories are finished, and the impact we've had on others or on the wider world. Consistent with his focus on artists and their different forms of creative expression in earlier books, storytelling takes the spotlight in this one, specifically the power of sharing personal histories and secrets. And although this is a fantasy story, the supernatural elements in it are mostly limited to the benign, ghostly variety, as is the case in many of his novels. So what's my opinion of the book? Well, before answering that question, I need to place my response in the proper context. Because this is a Guy Gavriel K novel, I'm grading it on a tough curve. I'm not comparing All the Seas of the World to fantasy novels by other authors, I'm comparing it to the very high bar set by Kay's previous books. In my opinion, Kay has never written a book that's less than very good, and many of them are outstanding, and he's even crafted a few masterpieces. I'm very happy to say that his consistent record of high-quality storytelling remains intact with this new novel. However, I also have to say that this was one of his most disappointing books for me. Among other things, it fails to present the kind of compelling, emotion-laden narrative that makes A Brightness Long Ago very nearly a masterpiece, and it makes some of the same mistakes that sapped Children of Earth and Sky of its energy and consequence. And it makes a few more mistakes as well. Perhaps the book's biggest flaw for me is that Kay seems to be trying to accomplish too many objectives with it, and as a result, it doesn't feel cohesive enough. Instead, the narrative feels unfocused and cobbled together from various pieces and parts. At times, it's almost as if he's painting by numbers with a broad brush, trying to make sure that he hits key plot points and emotional beats at the right time, but without the degree of sustained development and support throughout the story, typically found in most of his other novels. To use a different analogy, it feels too much like an engineered story with carefully designed and orchestrated elements that feel planned and structured rather than like the organic outgrowth of a creative mind. This might be the result of Kay trying too hard to tie together his previous books, and not just the other two books in this trilogy, but also some of the events, conflicts, and themes found in The Lions of al Rasan and The Serentine Mosaic. There are many call-outs and Easter eggs in this book that make reference to those earlier books. Some of them work just fine, but others feel a little forced, particularly when they involve coincidental encounters with characters and places featured in those other books. Other examples of things that didn't feel quite right to me include 
The primary conflicts driving the plot aren't as obsessively personal and focused as they are in books such as A Brightness Long Ago or A Song for Our Bomb, where personal animosities between individuals propel those stories and define the stakes at their climaxes. Instead, the conflicts and motivations in all the seas of the world tend to have broader and more diffuse targets, such as the desire of the Jedi aristocracy to be perceived as striking a blow against Asherite encroachment on their domains and legacies, or Lenya's general desire to exact revenge on all Asherites for her years of enslavement, or the broad desire of the Kindath to find places of refuge and acceptance in a hostile world. As a result, although the stakes might be bigger and more consequential because of the wider scope of some of the conflicts in this book, they actually seem smaller and less emotionally satisfying because they're less focused. And to the extent there are personal conflicts, some of them feel a little perfunctory, as if Kay's simply checking off topics on a list. This felt particularly true for some of the mysteries surrounding certain characters and their motivations that are hinted at throughout most of the book. Several of those mysteries are underdeveloped and largely inconsequential. Also, as in Children of Earth and Sky, there are too many point-of-view characters, and some of them are extremely minor peripheral characters whose only purpose is to provide a mouthpiece for Kay to engage in gratuitous rhapsodizing. Yes, I am criticizing Kay's writing style in this one. Now, most of the book is beautifully written as one would expect from Kay, and he has always had an affinity for rhetorical flourishes that interrupt his narrative to provide profound and lovely grace notes. In this case, though, he goes a little overboard. On several occasions throughout the book, Kay stops the narrative to peer into the future and wax eloquent about the legacy of a particular peripheral character who has no real bearing on the central plot of the story. These interruptions are confusing because they mislead the reader into thinking they're relevant, when in actuality they're little more than heavy-handed efforts by Kay to reiterate his underlying theme of how individuals' actions create future legacies. Also confusing are strange shifts between third-person and first-person point-of-view narration for one of the peripheral characters. It's as if Kay was experimenting with different narrative approaches in early drafts of the novel, in this case an epistolary approach that had the character either reading from or writing his memoir in old age. But the character isn't presented that way consistently in the book, and there's no explanation given. Other criticisms include excessive foreshadowing in this book of events that occur in Children of Earth and Sky, in the event one chooses to read this trilogy in chronological order. The main characters, Raphael and Linya, are frequently separated from one another geographically, causing their story arcs to feel disconnected and isolated. Also, the supernatural elements seem more forced and less integral to the story. And to the extent that there's a love story in the book, it's half-baked at best. This novel lacks the same degree of emotional intensity, bard-like rhythms, and romantic sheen found in most of Kay's works, which is why it was a disappointment for me. But is it a good book, and would I recommend it? Absolutely. Objectively speaking, it's a very good and enjoyable novel. But grading on the tough curves set by his previous books, this is not Kay at his best. Consequently, I'd rank All the Seas of the World near the bottom of his works, which is unfortunate, because this book almost felt like a swan song or a farewell tour for Kay, in which he's saying goodbye to this fictional world he's created. It makes me wonder if his heavy focus on death and human legacy in the book is a foreshadowing of the end of his writing career. I truly hope this isn't the last novel Kay plans to write. If you enjoyed this review of Guy Gavriel Kay's latest novel, All the Seas of the World, or found it helpful, please leave a comment below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the book. Coming soon, my next video will be the second installment in my series exploring Michael Moorcock's Eternal Champion Saga, so stay tuned. Thanks for watching.